the growing body of evidence that suggests that you you do think with your body. So in other words, yeah, you can have more creative thoughts when you're walking than when you're sitting down, that we understand numbers as children, you know, we, we count on our fingers, we do that for a reason, right? We are thinking through our body. So I suppose a broader point and a broader message from the book is that, you know, when, it, when you need to do some thinking, when you need to, to be more creative, when you need to unlock a problem, it's more than likely that you'll achieve that better when you deploy your body, when you walk or when you do something, than when you just sit sit still, sit, sit rigidly mm. and try to kind of muscle through it as it were with your brain alone. Welcome to The Balance Theory, a podcast aimed at arming you with tools and tips so that you are well equipped to not only identify and define, but own your own definition of balance. I'm your host, Erica, and thank you for joining me today. Hey, Balancers, and welcome back to episode 48 of The Balance Theory podcast. If this is your first time tuning in, a very warm welcome to The Balancer community. Now, on Friday, that's just passed, I had a little bit of an urge to record a little bit of an impromptu episode on my thoughts on our balance during lockdown. So I'm in Sydney. So for those of you here with me, we're obviously heading into week five now with no end in sight. But I think this is a really opportune time to stop, reflect and consider how our balance is at this point in time. So, you know, often work-life balance and conversations around that really only at the fore when we're talking about hustling and mindset and all these like positive and like go, go, go type things. But I feel like at a time in life when everything's at a standstill, it provides a nice opportunity to sort of reflect on our balance and how it might be a little bit different at this point in time. And more to the point of the whole theory, it serves nicely as a reminder that balance will change, you know, as the ebbs and flows of life sort of come your way. And this per- this period in time, no doubt, is no exception. So I urge anyone who hasn't had a listen, who might be feeling like the balance is a little bit off right now, or they haven't even thought about what that looks like right now and how it might need to be adjusted, go and give that a listen. It's only about six minutes long, and I'd love to hear all your thoughts. Now, before we dive into today's guest, I did want to share another amazing review that I've received. And I do want to thank each and every one of you that take the time to leave it. It's really amazing to see your thoughts written out and how you guys feel about the podcast and all the listeners. It really makes my day. And again, it really does help other people work out if the Balance Theory podcast is a good fit for what they're looking for at this point in their lives. So a big thank you to everyone. This one comes from Rima. And it says, a must listen. There is something for everyone in the Balance Theory podcast. I'm an OG listener and the Balance Theory has helped me in all my areas of health, relationships and fulfillment. Erica articulates information so well and so easy to digest. All guests have been fabulous with such valuable advice and life experiences. A big thank you, Rima, and everyone else who has or will leave a review. I truly appreciate it. Now on to today's guest. I have Simon Roberts on the podcast, who is an author all the way from the UK. So I actually came across Simon because I read his book titled, which is also the title of this podcast, The Power of Not Thinking. So backstory, my brother actually gave it to my partner for Christmas. I think he thought he was being a little bit funny because my partner's always on the go, always thinking, always doing stuff. So he gave it to him as sort of like a hint, hint, I think. But in true style, Unj flicked me the book because generally what happens is I speed read it. I'm a really, really fast reader. And I, if I get into a book, I just pump through it and then I give him sort of the highlights, which I guess works well for us. So When I picked up this book, I thought I was going to get all these tips and tricks on how to switch off my brain, how to not have thoughts, all those magical things that we all desire. However, I was pleasantly surprised at the approach this book took and the different sort of aspects it tied in to this concept of not thinking. So what we speak about today on the podcast really starts in the idea of how we express knowledge and this idea that when we feel something, it's more profound than just seeing or hearing it. And it's this concept of we always say uh, mind over matter, mindset is everything, et cetera, et cetera. But Simon's approach is really all about not putting the mind first, but the body first. For example, how do you explain to somebody how to ride a bike? It's really hard when you think about all the actual mechanical bits and pieces of how to do it, but your body just knows. It's this idea of embodiment, embodied knowledge. Your body has the answers. It has the idea of how to do things. And sometimes we just can't explain it. Also along those lines of just your intuition. And I think this is a really nice idea when speaking about our balance, because often we just focus on the mind and we really do forget about our body. So I'll just quickly share a recent experience I had. 
a couple of personal things happened that really kind of threw me off my horse. And I was implementing all my mindset tools, up my meditation. I took away things that were stressing me out, but I was kind of still feeling a little bit off. And when I spoke to my therapist, she said to me, what, what are you doing for your body? And that's when it clicked to me that there is absolutely nothing wrong with doing all these things for your mind, but sometimes your mind and your body aren't connected. I'm sure you know exactly what I mean. I'm sure you've been there before. And so I really like this conversation because it reframed that idea that the mind comes first and the role our body actually has to play in backing yourself and in giving you that balance in life. So on this note, Simon and I also talk about the concept of body storming instead of brainstorming, how this concept can be used in marketing and business in actually implementing team strategies or, or campaigns, things like that. He gives a, a couple of really cool examples. We also talk about this concept and its role in empathy and your own personal balance. It's a really, really different episode. So I hope you guys love it, but I got a lot out of it and it was really nice to interview Simon beyond just reading the book. Take a screenshot and tag us. Let us know what your biggest takeaway was. And as always, if you're enjoying all the content you're seeing, it would mean the world to me if you took five minutes to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as we're an independent podcast and every review counts in helping us grow our community. That's it from me, guys. Let's dive straight in. Beautiful. All right. So today I'm joined by Simon Roberts, who is the author of The Power of Not Thinking, a book which I have read this year. It came in my top 10 for the first half of the year. So welcome, Simon. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. And streaming all the way from London, I was really glad we could tee up a time to chat about this, um, your whole concept, and I guess uh, why you've put it out there. So I guess so our listeners can get a little bit of a feel for who you are and what you do, because I know it's not actually something you really disclose much in the book. It really more is on the content. Can you share a little bit about uh, Simon? Yeah, so I'm, I'm an anthropologist. I did a PhD in anthropology focused on the satellite TV revolution in 1990s India. Um, and since the end of that decade, so for the last 20 odd years, I have worked uh, in business. So I style myself as a business anthropologist. I've worked uh, within a big corporation, so at Intel, um, who uh, was a big hire of anthropologists back in the day. Um, and primarily worked as a consultant. So consulting uh, right now for um, companies primarily in the tech sector um, through my London-based uh, agency, Stripe Partners. Awesome. And how did uh, your journey to becoming an author sort of come about? Well, one of the things that we thought a lot about when we set Stripe Partners up uh, about seven or eight years ago was primarily, I think, uh, you, you know, the idea that many researchers and consultants and strategists spend an, an awful lot of time thinking about how to have impact. What we saw and um, I'd experienced through my working life was that consultants tend to want to put things down on PowerPoint decks and then assume that because you've written something down and you've made it look beautiful, that that in itself will be a driver of change within an organization. Um, and it struck us that actually that's not entirely wrong, but, but often largely wrong. And that one of the ways in which you have impact in an organization is to make it possible for executives to really feel something rather than just to hear it or read it on a PowerPoint slide or in a memo or on a document. And so we ran a series of projects where we took that theory and put it into practice and it was super successful. And as a result, I wanted to then better understand why it had been successful, what's going on when you give people knowledge in a different sort of way or enable knowledge in a different sort of way, a way that's not sort of mind first, but body first. Interesting. And so came the book. And so were you always heart set on writing a book or was it something that just sort of popped up as your career progressed? Because I can imagine it's no easy feat. Um, yeah, I mean, I look, to be honest, there's, 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 always, there's always that kind of, you know, middle-aged angst, right, which is I think there's a book in me somewhere. <laughs> um, but I think also having trained as an academic and, and always been somewhat frustrated. I mean, I love what academics do, but one thing they're not very good at is communicating their ideas to a wide audience. And 
and in a way for me part of the challenge was to take um was to sort of try and throw off some of my academic training and really learn how to to write which i hope i've done successfully for a wider audience um and and yeah and I, i suppose at the end of the day there's also a you know a more commercial motivation for writing a book when you run a consultancy which is it's a very good calling card um perhaps not as good a calling card as I might have hoped but (laughs) um but it is a good calling card because I think everyone gets kind of bored of consultants wanting to speak at conferences and present case studies so um it can be a little different if you've developed something up into a book um and you have um some novel um, thinking uh, to share with an audience. Of course, COVID has put pay to to anything like that. Um, yeah. So conference conferences are not are not exactly the order of the day. And of course, I you know the book is about um, living through the body, not not living through Zoom. So um, so yes, it's uh, the timing was immaculate. Let's say that. Yeah, yeah, no doubt it was. Um, my brother actually got the book for my partner at Christmas and because um, I'm quite a fast and avid reader, my partner said, always kind of gives me the ones he wants to read and says, just give me the summary. So I was really, it sort of fell into my hands in a bit of a, a strange, uh, long-winded way, although I love the, uh, the title of it, The Power of Not Thinking. And I guess like now that I've read it and having spoken to you, I can kind of see the motivation of how the concept came to be. But for those listening, can you explain exactly what you mean when we talk about embodied knowledge yeah so embodied knowledge is an idea um as the title suggests as the as the, the idea of embodied knowledge suggests that is knowledge that comes to reside in our bodies um so it is a supplement to not a uh entirely a a, a substitute for the sort of knowledge that we have in our in our heads, in our minds. Um, and embodied knowledge plays out in many, many, many aspects of our everyday life. So one of the examples I use in the book is riding a bicycle. Um, now, if you ask somebody how they ride a bicycle, um, they're pretty unlikely to be able to tell you what it is they're doing. You know, there's a lot of complex mechanics and physics and gravity and other complex stuff that's going on when you're riding a bicycle. But you really don't need to be aware of all of that um, in order to successfully ride a bike. The other thing about riding a bike is it's something you rarely forget how to do. So once you've learned to do it, which often we do when we're quite young, um, and incidentally, we're taught how to do it by parents uh, who don't really know how it is that they ride a bike. So they just say, (laughs) pedal as quickly as you can keep going keep going um but once you've learned how to do that um you never forget it so embodied knowledge has this other kind of characteristic which is that you retain it um and you retain it um uh, and then can apply it in a whole range of different settings so you can jump on any sort of bicycle i mean maybe not a penny farthing but most bicycles you can jump on on any road surface in any conditions, in any country, and just do it. So it's it's also, you know, this sort of knowledge is, is actually really flexible as well. It's really malleable. It's really context um, kind of independent. Um, so embodied knowledge then is this sort of way that, that humans have of, of knowing how to do things without being aware of the underlying principles that, uh, that govern them uh, or govern that activity. Um, so one, nice way of putting it is your body just knows what to do and you yep. find that sort of knowledge in every aspect of of our everyday existence from riding bikes to scrambling eggs to um you know uh, i don't know turning on a shower you know your body just does stuff without you necessarily knowing uh, or consciously thinking about what it is that it's actually doing yeah Absolutely. And I guess the reason I love this whole concept and why I was drawn to not only finish the book, but then reach out to you as well is because I think we live in an era where the phrase mindset or uh, mind over matter, those sorts of concepts are really front and fore of a conversation. And when we talk about being intuitive or listening to intuition, to me, that's find the source in the body. And so I think this conversation sort of flips the whole mindset first dialogue and you give so many examples in the book where you know the body really is 
the storehouse or the, or the know-how. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I want to know what your thoughts are on how this concept can teach us something about our intuition. Is it something that you think can exist independently of a mindset or do you think, and do you think, or would you argue it's more important than I guess the knowledge retained in your mind? Or do you think that they are in coexistence and we've just forgotten to have a conversation about it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think, I mean, the first thing to say about intuition and, and much smarter people than me, particularly Daniel Kahneman, you know, who wrote the book, um, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. I think that's the name of the book. Yep, that's it. Um, and, and as he, you know, often we jump, we jump to what he calls system one thinking um, and don't slow down and employ system two thinking, that more kind of deliberative way of, of looking at things. So often we, we, you know, so first off, I think intuition alone can be dangerous. But but that said, there are many, many, many occasions, and I count them nearly one a day in talking to colleagues, you know, where people say, well, my gut says, or, you know, my gut feeling is. And there's a sense in which um, we, I think we've started to, we've started to, yeah, historically crowd out, you know, that sense of, of a gut feel, right? That we want to reach for data in some way. We want to uh, support everything that we do with data. And of course, you know, that's not a bad inclination. Um, you know, data matters, science matters. And we, we live in an era where, of course, a lot of, lot of that is under, is under threat from certain political quarters. So, um, but that said, I think, you know, there is something to be said for um, reminding ourselves or being reminded of what our bodies know, what our bodies feel about a situation. You know, so you can be, for example, in a meeting um, at work and and have an incredibly good sense of, of what the chemistry is, of what, you know, the mood music is, what the weather of a meeting is and and that's important and it's something that we need we do listen to but I think we need to be to be more aware of our ability um, to trust those intuitions right and a lot of the book is really an attempt to to understand how it is that we can go into a room and kind of read the mood right yeah and um and 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 that and that it's important that we listen to our bodies in those sorts of contexts because they are picking up things um, which you know are beyond, as it were, our, our conscious mind, um, and and they're worth tuning into. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, to your point about you know we're, we're kind of seeking the data and the facts. I think it comes down to. It's almost like you need validation for what your body's feeling sometimes. And um, the book really, I think, yeah. is encouraging in in bringing back that power and that source to your body. Um, although I do think there is merit, obviously, in, in um, fact and, you know, using your mind and all those things. But I think that, you know, our body is doing so many things all at once that it, it does know a thing or two about what's going on. And um I might just skip forward a question because I think this is a nice point to talk about uh, in the book, you know, you talk about embodied business. So you take the concept yeah. of embodied knowledge and you put it in the frame of empathy, in the frame of AI, in the frame of business. And I particularly like this section about business because you talk about, like you sort of express at the start, how you take executives and how you put them in different situations and see how they, uh, you know, are receptive to different types of knowledge and you gave the example of the Duracell executives and I might hand over yeah. to you to share the story so I don't butcher it but I'd love for you to just sort of tell that story and, and what your key learnings were from that because I think it showcases this concept really nicely. Yeah so and, and in, in a way the, the Duracell story is I would say the founding myth well it's, it's truthful but it's the founding story of our business. Um, so we were approached back in 2014 by uh, by a team from Duracell who had a load of data about different markets that they could expand into. One of those was uh, the world of the outdoors, 
Uh, so camping enthusiasts, hikers, you know, mountain climbers, that sort of that sort of category of consumer. And and they put a challenge to us, which was, you know, we want to approach this, our understanding of these people differently. So ordinarily, you know, we might have done a focus group, although as a company, we don't do focus groups or we might have done ethnographic research. So that's what anthropologists do, you know, go and hang out with people. But we might have done all of those things really without the Duracell team being involved themselves. And they had expressed a desire to be involved themselves. So we said, well, hey, you know, look, we're a, a, a young company. Let's take a risk. Let's let's take them camping. So we flew a bunch of of tents and camping equipment uh, into a national park um, outside San Diego in Southern California. And uh, we went camping for the weekend and we had a bunch of outdoor enthusiasts that came and join us. And we spent some time together learning about what the outdoors means to people. And of course, you know, we learn about what the outdoors meant to people through talking to campers. But fundamentally, what we were doing is learning about the outdoors and what it means to people by doing it ourselves, by by feeling cold, you know, by 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 cooking together, uh, by walking together and centrally, of course, for the project, by using equipment together. So, you know, by understanding the importance of of good kit and by extension, the importance of a good battery inside kit, um, you know, that makes the experience both safe you know, and comfortable um, and enjoyable for outdoors enthusiasts. So the net net of the project was a a sense of of really good insight into what motivates this segment, Um, but not just a a good sense, um, you know, that was kind of put down on on a PowerPoint slide, but an embodied sense of like what matters to these people and an embodied sense of what the core insight was, which was, look, you invest a lot in really great kit to make your outdoors life safe and enjoyable. What about the battery that goes into that kit? Mm. Yeah, so within a week, we spent a week in San Diego in, in, in total. By the end of that week, you know, the marketing team and the ad agency and the media planners had essentially crafted you know, the fundamentals of a campaign, which then turned into one of the most successful ad um, campaigns, marketing campaigns that Duracell had ever run. And the marketing director for North America said, you know, what made it so successful was, you know, that deep sense that all of the team had of what matters, what makes people tick. And it was at the end of that week, you know, when I kind of high five with my business partners and said, well, great. You know, we basically got a, a concept here. We've got something that we can we can repeat with other clients. Um, and and I, I think that was the germ at which, you know, to back back to where we began, which is, that was the point at which I said, well, what really was going on there? That's why I wanted to write the book to figure out, like, what is it that happens when you just get something when you just understand it and you just got that wonderful sense of, okay, I really understand this space, this cultural context, and I know what to do about it. Um, and, and look, businesses don't do that a lot. You know, they get consultants to go and run focus groups. They run big surveys. They do big data. Um, but there's something more fundamental that should sit at the heart of all good business strategy, which is an embodied sense of what matters to people. Yeah, I love that. And I really, really do love that approach. It is super refreshing. Um, So obviously there is still some merit in the big data and the surveys and the focus groups and all of that. What what is your kind of, you know, at what point do you choose to do the embodied knowledge stuff? Because, I mean, this is me assuming, but I'm guessing it may not be appropriate in every single situation so at what point do you decide to do that with a client if it is something as big as you know taking the team out camping or doing something more local um or is it your default in all business sort of consulting decisions well of course prior to february 2020 it, it was actually pretty much our default um and and it was our default not just because um not just because of the fact that going places with people and helping them experience the world um, 
works. But also, I think one of the other diseases of modern business, if you will, is that everyone's day is essentially taken up by, you know, endless half hour meetings. And the fundamental component, I think, of good execution in a business is alignment. So the secondary benefit of, of taking people away is that the team that's responsible for executing a strategy get time together. Mm. Um, so, but to answer your question more, more, more specifically, you know, for us, it is not about either or it's about both and, and yeah. all of the companies that we work with, of course, many of them are tech businesses. They are swimming in data, but what you need is better on to interrogate, better interrogate the data to say, well, why are we seeing this? Um, so it's about the coupling of, of sort of big data or traditional company data with an embodied understanding of the world. So the way I think I put it in the book is, you know, the facts of the matter don't really make sense until you have a feel for how things are. Um, so I think in an ideal world, you know, we're about trying to give people um, both um, and ideally, we, you know, we try and take data scientists with us um, because not because they're skeptical of our approach, but actually, you know, evidence has shown that, you know, they're, they're really kind of um, empowered by, by, by an approach that's grounded first off in the real world. And then they can go back and say, OK, um, that's where I might look for, for signal. Um, and this is how I might make sense of this signal. Um, so that's 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 I think the main story for us is it's both and not either or. Yeah. And um, I do quite like that. And if we kind of look at that on a more macro point of view and if we're mm. talking about, say, the individual person and their experience of embodied knowledge and, and you look at data as more like their thoughts and I guess mindset view of the world it really is a, a combination of both. It's not as though you can rely solely on one or the other. So I think that's almost like a nice little personal anecdote for anyone yeah. in a self-reflective point of view. But um, I know you also speak about uh, empathy. You dedicated, I think, a whole chapter to it in the book. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious to, I guess, get your thoughts on how this concept can bolster empathy because I think when we're talking about you know I guess on the podcast we speak a lot about balance and and our conversation yeah. here today I think is to really empower people to trust their bodies and to not totally ignore that and just rely solely on their mindset and but then I think a second piece of that is empathy in the way we interact with others because that obviously highly impacts how we feel and you know throws us off our course and our balance at times so uh, would you mind sharing your thoughts I guess on how embodied knowledge has a role to play in empathy yeah, for sure. I mean, first off, I think um, you know the word empathy is thrown around a lot these days, and you know, and for good for good reason, it it, it matters. Um, but oftentimes, the way that we think about empathy is through, should we say, a psychological lens, right? We talk about it as 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 kind of getting into the mind of other people, or appreciating, or empathizing with with how others are thinking. Um, and, and the explanations for it are, are psychological often in, in, in the way that they're framed. Um, so what I do in the book is, is explore actually the, the kind of the bodily dimensions of empathy. In other words, to truly back to the camping, you know, in order to truly understand what it is like to be an outdoor enthusiast, you have to experience the cold, you have to experience the dark, you have to experience rain or hunger, or, or so you actually have to experience a physical state in order to get into, as it were, the mental state of, 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 of somebody else. Um, and there are a range of different scientific disciplines beyond sort of anthropology and philosophy, um, that provide pretty good evidence for the fact that empathy, you know, comes from um, bodily experience as much as, as kind of trying to transfer your way of thinking to what it might be, uh, to what other people may be thinking. Um, and one of those, one of those bits of, of, of science um, is this idea of, 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 of mirror neurons. Um, so mirror, mirror neurons are sort of 
broadly speaking, I think you could say they're controversial in that they have they have or they haven't been found in humans, but they are found in primates. And and simply put, there are neurons in our brain which respond, which when we see people doing things, um, or even when we do things that we've seen other people do, our bodies mirror, our brains mirror what it is uh, that we have, um, we've seen. So an example of that, um, you know, might be, um, well, in the, in the original science, uh, uh, this, the, the scientists looked at, um, they looked at, at monkeys and they noticed that bits of people's brains, of, of bits of the monkeys' brains were firing up uh, when they saw the researchers um, eating an ice cream, but it was the same bit of the brain that was lighting up in the in the monkey's brain when it itself was 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 eating peanuts. So, in other words, you know, the act of eating fired in 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 the same place in a monkey's brain as it did when it watched other people eat, um, which led to this idea that we may not necessarily need to. Um, we may need to sort of experience other people doing things in order to, to, to have the same uh, experience uh, ourselves of, of what they're doing. Um, so, um, so, so for me, I think there, there is an important aspect here, which is that um, empathy is not just a mental state. It's actually a, a sort of a physical, a physical thing. Yep. Absolutely. And, and to your point, I guess, if you're struggling to empathize, uh, it's probably because you haven't physically experienced that. Cause I'm sure everyone listening can think of a time where they have physically gone through something, um, or, or felt something. And then the second it happens to someone else, they can feel it. They, you know, they can respond to it. So I think this concept yeah. has a big role to play in, uh, empathy as it stands and also understanding, or at least respecting, I suppose, what other people are doing purely because you haven't had the same shared embodied knowledge. So I think it's a really, yeah. uh, it's a nice concept to sort of think about in the context of existing in a community. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd love, sorry, after you? No, I mean, I think, yeah, you see plenty of examples of it. Um, I mean, I talk about a few, a few examples in the book, which are kind of much more, uh, yeah, perhaps much more unique, like the refugee simulation in in Hong Kong. But you know, you you can think of many examples in um, you know as charities try to raise money for homeless people. Right, one of the ways they do it is they encourage people to sleep outside for themselves. Um, and um, and you could look at that as a sort of tricksy theatrical thing. But um, I would kind of hazard a guess that it's pretty difficult to understand what it's like to be homeless until you know, you've slept in a doorway in the cold in London, you know, and had people urinate on you on their way back from the pub, right? So um, so for me, it's fundamental that if we're going to talk about empathy, we talk about the physical, um, you know, experiential um, aspects of, of where kind of profound empathy comes from. Yeah, absolutely. Now, something else you talk about in the book is this concept of body storming. And um, mm. it's almost like a, an add-on, or I don't want to say improvement, but it's it's a nice way to rethink, you know, the concept of brainstorming. So can you talk a little bit yeah. to what body storming is um, and yeah. if you think it offers anything uh, better or different to yeah. the traditional yeah. brainstorming? Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you think about the term brainstorming, you know, it's a really good example of, of, of how culturally we're inclined to think that everything important comes out of our heads, right? Um, so body storming is a, a, a sort of a, a set of techniques that um, emerged in the 90s in the design community, um, people at IDEO, people at Intel, and a place called Interval Research um, started to, playing around with the idea of acting out ideas or acting out scenarios. So it can take many different forms. I mean, one is to, uh, you know, without any, you know, physical um, props or, or artifacts to kind of to act out a scene. So I talk in the book about um, designers at IDEO who were um, 
uh, trying to create a um, a device that would uh, restart someone's heart if they had a, a cardiac arrest, people with pacemakers. Um, and so what this device is obviously going to do is deliver a kind of a, 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 a quite a quite a significant electric shock to an individual. So the way that they kind of explored the early prototypes was to just give people a pager. And then when the pager, um, you know, page them, you know, they would uh, pretend as it were uh, that they had just had an electric shock. Um, and IDEO wanted to understand, well, where, are, where, what are all the possible sort of scenarios in which people may find themselves where they have, a, have an electric shock? So if we act this out, we'll better understand, you know, the feasibility of this of this device. Um, but you can also use body storming um, in a way to understand what it is you already know about a situation um, or a context. So uh, we did a, a project with a, a an industrial packaged gas company. So a bit niche um they're a very big company in france and we were coming up with new ideas for how they might interact with their customers and um we acted out some of those ideas and what was fascinating about acting out those ideas was ideas that look great on paper and one of them was a kind of an ai bot you know every brainstorm involves an ai bot hmm. um but when we acted it out um everybody immediately realized you know, intuitively, instinctively, that this was a terrible idea. Um, and it wasn't consistent with, with how they wanted to operate with their customers. So by acting things out, I think we can expose ideas to, um, you know, to a different form of truth, as it were, to a different form of understanding and, and, and test them and explore them. Um, so again, like everything, maybe I'm just a sort of English pragmatist, but it's not about brainstorming versus body storming. It's about saying they could work really well together. Yeah. Um, it's in tandem um, that you can um, that you can leverage um, both of them. Um, and there's you know a good smattering of articles out there in the world from the, in the design community about how body storming. Um, uh, can be can be put to practice um and yeah and i talk about it in the book because i think it's it's fun it's engaging and it also exposes us to things that we didn't know that we knew yeah absolutely and do you have any sort of um even if it's just one like a practical example of how somebody could use the concept of body storming uh when sort of maybe reflecting on their own life like is because when you say acting out i think uh, people might be put off like in the sense they might feel a bit silly about it or, you know, they think I'm, I'm not really that theatrical or like is there more uh, practical ways you can think of the top of your head that that might play out in someone's actual lived experience, like separate from a business, I'd say. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think one of the things that, you know, again, consistent with this idea of how humans learn when they're in contact with each other, I think one of the you know, one of the challenges to the question that you, you you know you just posed is that that actually what body storming does is bring out mutual understanding between individuals between groups of, in groups of people because you know you can feel the awkwardness of things you can feel where something kind of just works so it's difficult to sort of it's it's difficult to imagine a scenario in which one might want to act um to act out something uh you know solo but one could think of uh, perhaps the importance you know lots of people who do presentations you know or big conference presentations you know ex talk a lot about how, how it's so important to rehearse right mm. and so you could think of a job interview or a big presentation and reflect on the fact that actually rehearsing that and and getting comfortable within your own body um, of um, of even just you know moving up and down the stage or using your body to communicate different points or to place emphasis, those things are worth rehearsing. Um, so I don't know if that's a very good answer, but I think you know whenever we're encouraged to practice something, and practice is something I talk a lot about in the book. Um, it makes us more comfortable. It makes us more fluid and fluent in what we're doing. So I perhaps I would 
flip it a little bit and 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 talk about sort of body storming in the context of practicing things and and getting comfortable with them and fluid with them Absolutely. I think that's a great answer because often when we get nervous or uncomfortable about things, you know, you try and meditate, you're trying to shoo away kind of negative thoughts, those sorts of things, but where do we feel it? It's generally in our body. And so I think if you can prepare for that or, or, you know, anticipate sort of scenarios where you may feel out of touch with your body, I think that that's could be a really useful tool. So, yeah, no, I think that's a great response. Absolutely. Um, A different way of, uh, sorry. And uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a, growing body of evidence that that suggests that you know which i talk about in the book the growing body of evidence that suggests that you you do think with your body so in other words yeah you can have more creative thoughts when you're walking than when you're sitting down um that we understand numbers as children you know we we count on our fingers we do that for a reason right we are thinking through our body so i suppose a broader point and a broader message from the book is that, um, you know, when it, when you need to do some thinking, when you need to, to be more creative, when you need to unlock a problem, it's more than likely that you'll achieve that better when you deploy your body, when you walk or when you do something than when you just sit, sit still, sit, sit rigidly Mm. and try to kind of muscle through it as it were with your brain alone. Yeah, no, I think that's a great tip. I think um, we've got time for one final question before I mm. let you go. And um, I quite like how you loop in the concept of AI, uh, more specifically limitations with AI. I think it's such yeah. a, it's such an interesting uh, realm. And I quite like how you focus in the book on, you know, how AI has been able to develop and become the smartest with all these complex games that traditionally humans were the, the best at and et cetera. But what it can't do is, mask uh, it can't get on top of the simple human things that truly rely on embodied knowledge so you give the example of picking up a pen which when you you know I, I feel like all these examples are things we go so mindlessly you know you just pick it up you don't think about the pressure the gravity all those things but it's not something we've been able to replicate with AI so what are your kind of uh, projections with the future of AI do you think do you foresee a future where embodied knowledge can cross over and AI might be able to get on top of that or do you just think that that's too far beyond that realm um. Yeah, no. It, oh God, it's a, that's a hard last question. I think there's a couple of things. I mean, you know, somebody, you know, I quote in the book uh, once talked about the fact that you know, as we now know, you know, computers are better at chess than than humans. They're better at Go than humans. Um, um, but what's fascinating is that you know they're better at those as cognitive exercises, but you ask a robot to try and, you know, quickly put all the pieces back on a chessboard, right? And it's just gonna, it's gonna struggle. Um, And it's certainly gonna struggle unless it has been designed in order to do that one particular task. So, you know, it's a good reminder of the fact that robots are very, very unusually a multi-purpose, right? Mm. You know, they're very good at spraying a door on a car in a factory, but if you ask it to clean a swimming pool, it's really gonna struggle. So it's a good reminder that humans are are very multi-purpose in that sense. Um, But to more centrally address your question, you know, it, it fundamentally comes down to a question of, 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 of can computers, you know, can an AI be intelligent, which, you know, then throws out the question, well, what on earth do we mean by intelligence? And, you know, and a simple, a simple definition of intelligence is the ability to, to survive and adapt in a whole range of different scenarios, right? Um, and, and it's pretty clear to me that intelligence as broad as, as understood in those broad terms, yeah, general intelligence um, is not imaginable without an, a, the ability for that intelligence to operate in uh, the world, to actually to understand the world by moving around it, um, by understanding it in, in a huge number of different sensory uh, ways, which is something that our bodies um, enable. So I suppose at the heart of the book, you know, I'm I'm really saying that our intelligence comes from minds and bodies, and from and from minds in bodies. Mm. Um, and if you do not have an ability to truly understand, you know, all aspects of the world, you know, in all 
the multiple dimensions that we understand the world when we're when we are inhabiting it um we will not have anything that approaches human like intelligence which is not to say that there are aspects of of the world that are going to be better handled by computers by ais um but i have no um no qualms in saying that human level intelligence is either many many centuries off or or impossible to imagine um that's a bold claim um <laughs> maybe in our I lifetime think, i don't think in our lifetime i mean you look at as i do you you look at, at driverless cars right um they failed you know, it's quite clear that, you know, driverless cars of the type that we were promised, um, as it were, are not coming anytime soon. And in fact, the only way that you can make driverless cars work is to adapt the environment around them, mm. right? Because they are unable to adapt themselves to the different environments in which they find themselves. So you, you know, you change the dynamics and the organization and the laws and the technology uh, within cities in order to enable those cars. Well, humans can just drive cars in any condition, in any city, whether it's Rome or Sydney or Bombay, mm. right? Um, and so, you know, cars are a really good example. This stuff is incredibly hard. Humans are bloody amazing. Mm. Um, and we are not, um, we're not going to be outsmarted by driverless cars anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, and I think this whole conversation, uh, I guess it's more an intellectual curiosity of mine to, to kind of have this chat with you at the end. But I do think it, it does serve as a nice reminder of, you know, how complex and intelligent our bodies are that, you know, we can trust that they know what they're doing. And it just brings back that idea that, you know, when you have a gut feeling or when you're experiencing something physically, it, it, it's serving a purpose. And, you know, this this where we've evolved to as a species has taken so long that you know i think we we kind of know we know what we're doing <laughs> we do know what we're doing and 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 i know it's sort of it's a slightly naff way to end this but you know we're increasingly encouraged you know not to have faith in 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 these aspects of of our intelligence right that you know we should just look in the data and you know let's just and and of course that's 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 all good and well and true you know it is useful to look at data it is useful to respect the the amazing capabilities of of computing and ai but but fundamentally you know our intelligence is of a very different order um mm. and um you know and, and i think it's it's futile to try to think about reproducing it um you know let's let's think about where we can put this stuff to really good specific uses but you know the pursuit of something uh, of our level of intelligence i think is is kind of pointless and fanciful frankly there you go well i just want to thank you so much for your time i want to thank you for putting the book out there because it got me thinking about you know our bodies and knowledge and and the way you perceive the world in a very different and refreshing way, might I add. So I would strongly suggest to anyone who's enjoyed this chat or wants to know a little bit more about the power of not thinking, uh, which the book actually wasn't what I thought it was going to be, to be honest. I thought you were going to give me all these amazing tips on how to not have any thoughts ever, but I was pleasantly surprised, uh, you know, at the whole concept of embodied knowledge. And yeah, I just want to thank you so much for your time, for streaming all the way from London. And um, I'm looking forward to if you're ever bringing out another book as well. Well, I have started working on something, but uh, um, and it sort of picks up on some of these themes, right? It's about work and the future of work in the context of technology and automa automation and mechanization. So it's awesome. not a million miles off, but it's it's slightly different. But it'll be here all... before it'll be here before driverless cars. <laughs> it will be here before drivers because I I can assure you of that. And but at the moment it is um it is still just a cluster of post-it notes on the wall behind me. No worries, that's how it all starts. You'll have to drop me an email when it goes live. I will do. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap for this week, Balancers. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you found this episode useful to some degree in either steering or determining your definition of balance today. As always, the biggest compliment for us is if you share this episode with someone who you feel might need it, or if you're on Spotify, you can click follow or on Apple Podcasts, you can leave a rating or review. 
If you have any suggestions for up and coming podcasts, feel free to shoot us a DM or an email. Our Instagram is at the balance theory and our email is the balance theory podcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, you've always got the option of subscribing to our mailing list. We only send you email reminders when the episodes drop so you get them fresh out of the oven. No annoying spam, we promise. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and until next time, stay balanced. Balance.